Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts, P53, Guardian of the Genome. Do you want to understand P53? I mean, do you really want to understand P53? The role that it plays in carcinogenesis, the impact that it has on the molecular evolution of tumor cells, and how P53 function can determine whether your patient will respond to chemotherapy and radiation therapy or not. If you're interested in really understanding P53, come along. So in this video, I'm going to describe the various functions of P53, compare and contrast the pathways that lead to DNA repair, senescence, and apoptosis, and discuss how P53 defects affect carcinogenesis. So who is this P53 character anyway? P53 is a protein, a transcription factor, that is encoded by the TP53 tumor suppressor gene. This transcription factor is going to regulate genes involved in cell cycle arrest, apoptosis, and genes that enhance catabolism and inhibit anabolism. And through these, uh, it has an impact on cell cycle progression, DNA repair, cellular senescence, and apoptosis. So why is p53 so important? Well, it's the most frequently mutated gene in human cancers. P53's role is to be sure that your DNA is clean and safe, can be replicated and moved on to the next cell. So it's really keeping an eye to make sure that mutations and damage to DNA are not passed on. Now, mutations that knock out P53 uh, are seen in more than 50% of malignancies. And those that don't have mutations actually in, P in TP53 uh, can have other defects. Uh, so upstream or downstream factors like MDM2, which we'll talk about in a bit. P53 even plays a role in viral oncogenesis. So for example, uh, high-risk HPV E6 protein will bind and degrade P53, preventing it from its role in making sure that the genome is safe and intact. So TP53 is a tumor suppressor gene. So when we think of that, we typically uh, think of two mutations, biallelic to knock out the function, right? And this is usually going to be two somatic mutations will lead to malignancy. Now there's a rare syndrome where you have a germline mutation in TP53 called lee fraumeni syndrome. And patients with lee fraumeni syndrome get a wide variety of malignancies because P53 affects so many different cells. I mean, it's, it's not as restricted, for example, as what we see in RB mutations that lead to retinoblastoma. Patients with lee fraumeni syndrome uh, can get sarcomas, breast cancers, leukemias, brain tumors, and adrenal cortical carcinomas. And I just wanted to show you an image from a research paper that's looking at actual TP53 mutations in a variety of different uh, malignancies. And you can see just how many are affected uh, by TP53 mutations. So we have uh, ovary, colorectal, esophagus, uh, liver, brain, bladder, pretty much everything. So as I mentioned, P53 uh, keeps an eye on your DNA and it looks for DNA damage. And when it finds uh, DNA damage, there are three possible pathways we can go through. We start out with temporary cell cycle arrest or quiescence. What happens here is that P53 is going to upregulate P21 transcription, and we're going to go over the cell cycle in just a moment, in case you've forgotten what P21 does. P21 transcription is going to block the cyclin CDK complex and is also going to prevent RB phosphorylation. So this is going to le lead to temporary cell cycle arrest. Two other possibilities are permanent cell cycle arrest or senescence and apoptosis, which are mediated by P53 upregulating BACs and PUMA. If you need a little refresher on apoptosis, I have a video on that as well. Okay, quick refresher. So this is looking at the cell cycle. So you can imagine you have a cell that's sitting here quietly fast asleep. It receives uh, some growth signals and it enters G1. We have our centrosome duplication. And once we have sufficient uh, growth uh, factor uh, signaling going on, we move past the restriction point. This means we're headed on our way uh, to, uh, to cell divide. So we have to duplicate our DNA and move on. But before you duplicate your DNA, you wanna make sure it's in good shape. So we have this check for DNA damage at the G1, it's called the G1S checkpoint. Now, if the DNA is damaged, you can imagine that uh, you would want to pause and fix it. But if you don't have this checkpoint, 
you have damaged DNA and it's going to be it's going to be replicated. We're going to come along. We'll have cell division, and that cell is going to have uh, mutations in it as well, and it will continue along. There's going to be no uh, G1S checkpoint here, so we'll get additional mutations. So it's going to go on and on, accumulating more and more mutations, and this is going to contribute to tumor evolution, which we'll talk about in a bit. Now this is an image uh, from uh, Robin's uh, Pathologic Basis of Disease, uh, going into a little bit more detail of what's actually happening in our cell cycle. So the cell cycle is very complicated, and there's this uh, balance of inhibitors uh, and promoters are going to drive you forward or make you pause in the cell cycle. So here we have again our G1S, G2, and M. Right? And this is going to be our G1S transition, which is regulated uh, by the retinoblastoma protein, a separate video on that. And what moves us through here are going to be our cyclins. So for example, cyclin D, cyclin A. We have our cyclin-dependent kinases, and we have our cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitors. Right? So I want you to focus here on uh, cyclin D CDK4. Uh, as well as P21, because this is going to come up as we talk about P53 and its role in getting us uh, through this uh, transition point. I know this image is small. I'm going to blow it up, and we're going to do it in uh, slow, great detail. Okay, so this is uh, a drawing from uh, Robbins and Kumar, Basic Pathology, 11th edition. Uh, and while I'm going to go through each one individually, I think it's nice to look at them lined up side by side. So what we here have here on the left is a healthy cell with no DNA damage. Uh, and uh, what happens here, uh, I'll go through in a little bit of detail. Uh, here we have a healthy, happy cell, but now it has some DNA damage. So it's going to move through either to uh, having uh, uh, successful DNA repair, allowing it to go on with its life, or senescence or apoptosis. And then the third uh, pathway here that we're looking at is when you have uh, DNA damage and you have something that is preventing uh, adequate p53 function. And in this instance, you can drive on to malignancy. So let's look at each one individually. All right, happy, healthy, unstressed cell, right? All is good. Uh, it's got no DNA damage, and in this instance, P53 has a short half-life, uh, only about 20 minutes. And the reason is, is that there's a protein called MDM2, which will bind to P53 and degrade it, right? Because you don't need it around, nothing's going on, all is good. But there will be an instance where we want to have P53 around, so we have to figure out how to get rid of our MDM2. All right, so that's going to be in this panel, which is a little larger here. But let's look at it in this horizontal layout so we can go through it uh, more specifically. So here we have our normal happy healthy cell, wild type P53. All is good. But then something bad happens. Ionizing radiation, carcinogens, mutagens, oncogenic stress, hypoxia, and our DNA is damaged. What's going to happen then is that there will be some proteins that are sensors, and these uh, sensors are kinases. Uh, and what they will do is they'll tack a little uh, phosphate group here onto our P53. And once this is done, MDM2 will release the P53 and not degrade it. So the half-life will be expanded. What happens then is P53 is going to move on and bind to DNA. It's going to accumulate in the nucleus and bind to a variety of different uh, genes. One set of genes is going to lead to P53-dependent P21 transcription. Now remember, P21 is a CDK inhibitor, and what's going to happen then is the cell is going to go into G1 arrest. It's going to pause, right? So this is our quiescent. This pause is going to give us time uh, to repair our DNA. So how do we repair our DNA? The same time this is going on, we have P53 is going to be upregulating genes that are involved in DNA repair, such as GADD45. And if the world is just, we will have successful repair of our DNA. P53 will then upregulate transcription of MDM2, which will then begin degrading our P53, and our cell is right back to where it was before we had our DNA damage. And all is right with the world. But this is not always the case. So sometimes you have so much DNA damage that even after you've gone through your G1 arrest and you've upregulated your, uh, your, your DNA repair genes, the repair fails. 
And when this happens, there are two possibilities. And we're not really clear exactly how the cell decides whether it becomes senescent or whether it undergoes apoptosis. Uh, we do know that for senescence, in which the cell really just sort of goes to sleep, it, it doesn't die, but it does not continue to proliferate, uh, that it involves both P21 and RB. P53, as uh, I discussed earlier, uh, can also upregulate pro-apoptotic genes like Bax or Puma. And this is going to move us on to apoptosis. So if you think back to the previous panel, we either have DNA damage in which it's, we have complete repair and the cell moves on and proliferates, or we have, as in this picture, senescence and apoptosis. In both of these, we're not going to get proliferation of our cell. So whatever DNA damage is in this particular cell will not be transmitted on to future generations. So this is good. This is, this is how we stay healthy. However, what do we do if for some reason P53 is not functional? So in this, we're going to have our DNA damage, but we're not going to have our P53 dependent genes being upregulated. We're not going to go into cell cycle arrest. We're not going to have our DNA repaired. We won't go into senescence. And the cell will continue to progress through the cell cycle and expand. This is going to result, as I mentioned earlier, in additional mutations. And eventually, we have the possibility of a malignant tumor. Now, this is an image uh, from the ninth edition of Robin's Basic Pathology, which looks at some of this uh, tumor evolution. So when you have TP53 mutations, this is what we would call a mutator phenotype because you don't have any block on damage to DNA. So as we have our cell that was uh, initially healthy, now we have uh, some sort of DNA damage, the cell is going to replicate and it's going to pick up additional mutations each time. Some of these will be non-viable, these cells will die. Uh, some of them will uh, give additional functions like the ability to exist in a more hypoxic uh, environment, uh, perhaps to metastasize, uh, to uh, grow blood vessels, or, and this can have a profound impact on our patients, to become resistant uh, to therapy, to chemotherapy. Furthermore, if you think about how we typically treat uh, patients with uh, malignancies, we're going to use radiation and chemotherapy, and we're talking here about you know, not targeted chemotherapy, just general uh, chemotherapy. And when, with that type of treatment, what we're trying to do actually is to really damage the DNA. So radiation is going to cause lots of breaks in the DNA, and when that happens, Theoretically, P53 comes in and says, oh man, this is a real mess. You need to just shut down and die or go to sleep. But if you don't have P53, it's not going to have that response, right? So you get increased DNA damage. Okay, I'm going to talk just a little bit about the future uh, of TP TP53. Now, we're not there yet, but we're moving there. Because you may have asked, well, if P53 is so important in human malignancies, why haven't we targeted it for therapy? And there have been a lot of attempts uh, at doing this. It's not easy. For one thing, uh, typically what we see is down-regulation of P53. And for something like that, it's hard to have an intervention. When a protein is up-regulated, you can try to knock it down. But when you have lower activity, that can be more challenging. The other issue, of course, is that uh, P53 is a transcription factor in the nucleus, which makes it a little bit uh, less accessible. So, you can have malignancies due to uh, mutated TP53, or you can have, as I mentioned earlier, wild-type TP53. And in the former, uh, there have been attempts at therapy looking at suppressing the MDM2 and P53 interaction with the idea of blocking P53 degradation so that you can increase P53 con uh, concentrations and suppress tumorigenesis. Now, for mutated TP53, these are often uh, point mutations or missense mutations in particular hotspots. Uh, and so one thing that's been uh, attempted is looking to create small molecules that can reactivate wild-type P53 functions. And this is very challenging. But there are some other modalities as well. And this is uh, an image uh, from a, uh, uh, a review article. Uh, that goes over these possibilities. So as I mentioned, if you have wild-type P53, there have been some attempts to uh, inhibit the contact between the wild-type P53 and MDM2, uh, as well as MDM4, which we haven't discussed. Uh, another possibility is these uh, small molecules, uh, which are aimed at uh, converting uh, mutated P53 back to its normal, uh, uh, healthy, uh, active state. 
And then uh, a recent paper in Science uh, is uh, it's quite interesting. It's a bispecific antibody that targets mutant p53. Because the p53 is going to be uh, chopped up in the proteasome uh, and is going to be presented on the cell surface. And with this uh, particular uh, antibody, there's the idea of increasing uh, T cell killing of tumor cells. So that's the future. That's where we're, we're going. I'd like to finish up the discussion of uh, p53 just by going back again to HPV, because HPV plays a role in uh, carcinogenesis. And we talked about this, but now that we've gone through the whole pathway, I wanted to show you again. So as I mentioned before, HPV E6 protein uh, can bind to P53 and cause it to break down. So that's going to prevent uh, P53 from having its usual function. And the uh, HPV E7 protein actually inhibits P21. So uh, both of these are going to result in immortalization, increased cell proliferation, and genomic instability. Just to finish up, just so you can uh, check your comprehension, uh, see if you can answer these questions. What are the steps from DNA damage to senescence? And what are the steps from DNA damage to apoptosis? And then to think, if you have uh, happy, healthy P53, um, what other uh, proteins are involved in allowing carcinogenesis that are in the same pathway? So go back and take a look. Uh, finally, of course, I'd like to thank you. Uh, you can find me at Twitter. Uh, you can shoot me an email, and you can always find me at pathologycentral.org. Thank you very much for your time. Please put comments down below. Uh, they really help guide uh, the videos that I do and make me feel good. Have a great day.